Here's our little boys. These are bottle babies that I've been raising since spring. Nice, happy little guys. I thought I'd do a late summer update of the Paulonia elongata that we've been growing. These Paulonia trees, I purchased them back in January. They arrived in um, mid-spring. And uh, these are clones that I got from the World Paulonia Institute. And you might look at these and say, well, that is highly unimpressive. Um, I thought Paulonia was supposed to be the fastest growing tree in the world. And what I decided to do is I decided to do a little experiment. Since they're clones, it gives me a really good opportunity to understand exactly how these things behave in different soil conditions. Um, and since they're clones, you know that it's the soil conditions that are causing any variation instead of uh, variation due to genetics. So this first block that you're seeing is uh, Paulonia planted in rhizomous grass. So right here, this is some sort of fescue, I believe. And um, I planted three Paulonia clones in this fescue. And you can see this one is quite stunted. And this one here is non-existent, died. And this one here, also non-existent. It, oh, actually, no, this one's still growing. Look at that, tiny little leaves growing still. That's exciting. I thought this one died completely, but it is still alive, so there's that. So um, that was one set of results from the Paulonia experiment is that when we plant Paulonia into rhizomous grass, it will not thrive at all. So there's that. In this video, I keep coming back to the idea of blocking. And blocking is a statistical technique that says you're going to lay out some uh, beds or you're going to plant some trees and you need to decide on some arrangement of where those where those plants are going to be planted. So in this case, I'm looking at soil, uh, soil conditions. And so in this diagram, you can see that there's three different soil types. There's this lighter color, uh, medium color, and then the darker color. And I can arrange these plots anywhere on this field. Um, and so here I've shown this kind of haphazard arrangement of plots, and they're just spread out willy-nilly across this field. And you get a mixture of different soil types in each block. Well, that's a problem because now I can't tell how the soil is going to influence the block. So if instead I rotate the blocks or change the blocks so that each block is in one of those soil types, now I have a very clear uh, indication of this group of trees was influenced by this soil type, this other group of trees was influenced by this other soil type, and so on, because the soil is consistent throughout the block. So you might keep that in mind uh, if you're doing experiments of your own. And this is basically a uh, field, um, open field conditions. There is some rhizomous grass here, um, but it's not really um, intruding that much on the trees. And I did have one nice and healthy successful tree out of this. This one is the largest and then this one's surviving but certainly not thriving. And then this third one there were three trees in each block so this third tree in this block didn't make it. It survived for a while um, but after probably three four months in the ground it ended up dying on me. So that's block number two. And this is block number three. So there is some rhizomous grass here and you might say, oh, I thought you already did rhizomous grass. Don't you want something different for your third block? Well, this, this block is, um, there is some rhizomous grass here, but it's a different soil type. Uh, this used to be a driveway. And so this whole area is uh, gravel. And so this uh, area, um, even though it does have rhizomous grass, the soil type is so different that it really does constitute a whole different set of growing conditions. 
Um, all three of the trees survived in this block. This one's doing quite well. And um, an additional factor at play with this particular block is that this block has the full force of the afternoon winds. We're in coastal California. And in the afternoon, the winds pick up um, to, you know, around 20 miles an hour every single day, day in and day out. And so I thought that would be devastating for these Paulonia trees. But you'll notice it definitely got blown over. The winds come from this way in the afternoon. It got blown over, but as it sort of like acclimated to the wind, it did manage to right itself. And now it's going pretty much straight up um, despite being blown over at first. So um, it is uh, promising because I, I was convinced that these Paulonia trees were gonna do a terrible job in the wind since the wood is so light. But despite being a light wood, it's also a hardwood. And when I, when I press on this tree, it honestly feels like a very sturdy, tough, piece of wood that I'm pressing against. And so despite being in this constant, constant 20 mile an hour wind, the Paloni tree has responded and been able to right itself despite the very challenging conditions. You can see the leaf matter is just tremendous, huge, big old uh, pizza sized leaves here, which is amazing. That's exactly what I wanted Paulonia for is these great big leaves that I can feed to the animals. Um, they're not thriving like I would have hoped. They do have a lot of um, wind damage and there may be some insect damage and things like that. Um, but, you know, that one at least is doing quite well. This one you can see got blown over in the wind and it never really righted itself. It's, it looks like it may be turning upward at this point, but it didn't really thrive like the other one did so definitely got blown over in the wind and then it looks like it's slowly making its way back to vertical so those were all clones so this is block three um, one thing I want to highlight about these blocks is that in addition to the different soil types I also gave one out of the three clones a mycorrhizal fungus inoculum so this middle one here got a good healthy dose of that mycorrhizal inoculum and that may be why it's doing so well. In the other two blocks um, the mycorrhizal inoculated tree also did the best out of those three and so um, it's not conclusive evidence that that mycorrhizal fungus is doing anything definitively but it's evidence in support of that. Here's our little boys. These are bottle babies that I've been raising since spring happy little guys and this um, if you've seen one of my earlier videos this is a little setup that I've um, been using to grow these paulonia trees out in goat pasture hoping that um, it's, it's gonna be enough to prevent them from eating down the trees and it looks like it's been working so it's a uh, electric fencing that basically sets up this corridor where I can grow the trees uh, to, um, you know, kind of keep the goats out. And it's worked pretty well for the most part. This is a mix of black locust. You see this black locust tree here and paulonia. And these are not clones. These are all paulonia that I've grown from seed. And so this, it's hard to tell what's causing different levels of performance because each tree is different. It's a different genetic uh, composition. So um, some trees are doing quite well. We've got this beauty right here. This is the tallest one. It's over four feet tall. This was seeded back in January. So to have it grow four feet in a single season is quite remarkable. Um, a little bit shorter there, a nice and tall one here. This one's a little bit more stout, but it's very leafy, stout and leafy. Here the leaves are a little more sparse, but the leaves are quite large. So lots of interesting variation going on with these. When the goats do get in, they, they do get in occasionally. They usually eat down the black locust in preference over the um, paulonia.
And then what happens is as you get down toward this end, I think the water drops off and the water um, isn't sufficient to kind of give these guys the, the water that they need. So down at the end here, the trees are a lot smaller and more stunted and um, what do you call it? More, um, more stunted and more um, stressed. But down at this end, the water comes from this side. So I think the water pressure on this side is a little bit better. And so these guys have gotten enough water to thrive for this season. And so that's why I think it has this sort of gradient of this taller tree here, the tallest tree here. And then as you go down, the trees tend to drop off in height. Um, there is this interesting character right over here. This character right here has a <clears throat> nice height, nice and large tree, and it's also got a really thick trunk. This is a much thicker trunk than I've seen uh, compared to any of the other Paulonia trees. So this one, despite being on this sort of lower end of the gradient scale in terms of the water uh, amount that it's getting, it grew quite large, not, not just in height, but also in uh, the thickness of the trunk. So I'm quite interested in this individual. And that's one benefit of these, um, uh, of growing Paulonia from seed is that you get a lot more variation and now have this really nice individual that may show uh, genetic potential at being a great Paulonia tree. Of course, something else that might be going on is it may have tapped into a nice little um, nutrient reservoir or something, you know, maybe there's a squirrel midden that it found where there's lots of, um, lots of nutrients stored down there for one reason or another, or it could be that, um, maybe it's tapped into a water reservoir or something like that. So there's no telling exactly what has caused it, but it does show potentially signs of being a genetically superior tree. So I'm um, pretty exciting, um, to, to see that. And then I got these black locusts sprinkled throughout. Um, these guys are quite remarkable with their growth rate as well. But you'll notice that the leaf matter production is a lot lower on the black locust than on the paulonia. The paulonia, these, these leaves are quite large. And once I start feeding them to the animal, I think the leaf matter production from the paulonia is going to be significantly more than the leaf matter production from the black locust because these leaves are so small and fine, so. Anyway, um, that's just a little update there for you on the Paulonia elongata that I've planted, um, that I grew from seed starting in January of this year, and it's now currently the middle of September.